every Sunday we're going to pray for you to heaven. Yes. If God, if God takes, gives us a spirit of prayer, you know what? And it takes up the, the preaching time, then I just won't preach. If I pray, if we pray at the end of it, it takes up the worship time, then we just won't worship. Because there ain't nothing more powerful we can do than pray for Amen. Amen. But we're gonna we're gonna do that today. But before we pray then, we're gonna pray now that your ears will be open to hear what God has to say. And I will flow with him and, and my mind's gonna be dialed into him and to what he wants done to say exactly how what he wants to say it and how he wants to say it. I would appreciate you praying with me for that. Amen. That the ministry spirits that are here in this room that we acknowledge right now will help the word to be effective and powerful and will liberate you. Because God has the ability to take whatever I say and cause you to hear what you need to hear. Amen. 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 Now, the devil can do that too, but we're going to stop that before we get started. We're going to bind it back in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. This is your word. <laughs> your words are spirit and they are life. Your word is powerful. By your word, you created everything. You created us from the dust of the earth. You breathed into us the breath of life. And you spoke and it was. And Lord God, you're still speaking today. You still have chosen through what the what you say in your word is the foolishness of preaching that men might be saved, delivered, so so healed. Everything they need through your word. And Father, I pray right now that every ear, every heart is open to hear your word, to hear exactly how they need to hear it. Father God, we bind Satan from causing anyone to hear something that's not said or anything that he would want them to hear. But Father God, we say right now we take charge of every spirit, every human spirit, that they will hear the very word of God. For you sent your word, and you healed them. And Lord, this word, let it be healing and let it be life right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, Christy said before the service, she had to fight to get here this morning. Had a stomach thing. I declare right now in the mighty name of Jesus that that stomach thing is going. Yeah. That even before the service is over, you're going to be able to say, man, I'm glad I'm going to church because I got healed Hallelujah. just from the presence of God. Amen. We declare that done. We declare that done thing. Amen. I'm going to talk to you about what happens when the church prays together. Uh, before I do that, I want to read you this. Uh, a little boy wanted $100 badly. Anybody here want $100 badly? <laughs> oh, and, and he prayed to God. He prayed to God for a whole week, but nothing happened. So he decided to write a letter, to write God a letter requesting $100. When the post office got the letter addressed to God, they forwarded it on, they forwarded it on to the White House. The president was very impressed touched and amused, so he instructed his aide to send the boy $5. He thought $5 would be a lot to the little boy. The boy was indeed delighted by the money. He sat down and wrote a thank you note immediately, which read, Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you had to send it through Washington, and as usual, they kept most of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was good. <laughs> Amen. We won't talk about the power of corporate prayer. Prayer is the most powerful weapon on the face of this planet. When you read the book of Acts, we read of the great miracles the apostles did. We read of the great, uh, the great healings. We, we read of people being saved. But what you will see over and over and over and over again is the corporate, the church prayed together. Corporate, and they did it every day. It says when we, we often talk about the story of the crippled man, you know, that Peter and John were on their way to the temple. What did it say when they were on the temple floor? It was the hour of prayer. It was three o'clock. It was the hour of prayer. The church met together. When the first chapter, second chapter there, it says the church met daily together and they prayed together. And miracles happened out of that prayer. The thing that the devil has attacked the modern church with the most is to eliminate prayer, especially corporate prayer from the church. And he has done an excellent job. Most churches do not ever pray together, except the beginning of the service where you do that little mandatory religious thing that we call prayer. But I'm talking about when the church really locks down, gets in step. The only way we can come together and have the mind of Christ corporately is through praying together. Something happens when we pray together. 
we come together when we pray together. Now I'm not talking about now. Now when I when we pray at war, we're gonna pray together. I'm gonna lead, and I want you to follow. Now the Holy Ghost will get in there and be the leader very quickly. But if you're just listening, go in the same direction. Don't start individually praying. We're not here to pray for Tom and Susie, Aunt Susie, or anybody else when it's time to pray corporate. We're aimed together. We're praying together. Amen? Yeah. And things will happen. On February the 24th, 1991, y'all remember that, the Gulf War? A lightning ground offensive was launched by the U.S. and Allied forces in the Persian Gulf War. Its effectiveness shattered the defending Iraqi forces. Within days, the world's fourth largest army was crushed. Tens of thousands of prisoners of war were taken, and the conflict was ended. What explains this stunning defeat? For over a month, a relentless air campaign had targeted the defending forces. Its strategic penetration had broken the defenders' infrastructure and dissolved their power. That is what corporate prayer does. Corporate prayer is us taking charge of the airwaves. The reason the, uh, America is the strongest military on the face of the earth is we control the skies. In every combat, what are you trying to do? The high ground. You try to take the high ground. Right now, the enemy is controlling the high ground over our church. But that will soon end. Amen. That will soon be in because we are going to pray together. And if there's one thing the devil cannot do, he cannot stand up against is the church that prays. Amen. That's why he fights it so hard. That's why he tries to eliminate church praying more than any other thing. You know, he don't like preaching, but he can survive preaching. He has. He don't like worship, but he can survive worship. He has. But the one thing he cannot survive is a church that will pray. And let me tell you something, praying will not take anything away from the preaching. Matter of fact, it will make the preaching so much better. Prayer will not take away from worship, it will make worship so much better. Prayer will enhance and add to every particular thing that happens in this church. Amen. Amen. And without it, nothing will happen. Amen. Amen. We have substituted prayer, we've exchanged it for programs, We've exchanged it for preaching. We've exchanged it for everything else. And all of those things, the church has failed miserably. In the 70s and 80s, we decided we would not dress up and go to church. We would wear jeans and we would drink coffee and we would make it really comfortable for everybody. Well, that worked for a while. It's not working now. All of those things will draw people for a while. But the one thing that will keep you Praying together. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Everybody's real familiar with these scriptures. Please hear it with a new ear. Please hear it for the first time. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven, everybody say, When God shuts up heaven. When God shuts up heaven. Sometimes God will shut up heaven. See, that's, that's foreign to our uh, New, New Testament or the way we teach now that, that God would actually show up heaven. Sometimes God has to <coughs> do something to get your attention. Right? I'm going to tell you what makes some of you pray. Let the finances get tight in your house. You're about, you've got a new prayer here. Let a big bill be coming and you don't know how to pay it. Let that car tear up and you don't know how you're going to fix it. Let something get out of kilter the word all at once I'm desperate I need God and then you pray God told me years ago I remember I was a kid I was walking around and I said God what's it going to take to get your people to pray God said do not worry son he said my people will pray they will either pray voluntarily or they will pray under duress but my people will pray we're under duress everybody say we're under duress we're under duress and now we're going to pray. Now, I didn't say he, you know, he wouldn't, wouldn't answer if he was under duress. But sometimes it takes duress to make us pray. Sometimes we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to realize everything I've done is not working. 
Maybe it's time to go back to the foundation of the church. Maybe it's time to go back to what God said always in every generation, in every year, from beginning until end, has always, always will, and never will stop working, and that is prayer. Together. Praying individually works, but praying corporately is what a church must do. Amen. Amen. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon up by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land. You need to take note of that. God can command some things to be devoured. He says, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, everybody say if. 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 My people who are called by my name and here's four steps. Amen. We'll humble themselves. Before we, before you can truly pray, you have to humble yourself. Show my face. Glory to God. <laughs> before you can truly pray to God, you got to humble yourself. Amen. See, a lot of times in you know, our areas of pride, we go before God and what's called so-called prayer, and we start ordering God around. We start telling God what He's going to do and how He's going to do it and what we want Him to do. But when you humble yourself. You go in with a different attitude. We get the we get the order right. Let me tell you something. He's our father. I mean, I'm all about that. We can call him daddy. The Bible says that. We can say our father. There's a daddy relationship. But don't you ever forget he is God Almighty and you are not. Yes, we are created in his image, but he is the one that did create. He is big, powerful, and we are not. We come to him. Humble. And then we pray. And it didn't say one person did it. It said it's my people. Amen. It's the little thing. My people. If they will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. Now the face is different than the hand. Amen. Hand is what he gives you. Yes. That's a hand of provision. It's a hand of strength. But if you'll seek my face. When you see when you see a person's face, you can tell kind of what kind of where they're at. Amen. You know, you can see that joy, or if they're upset, you can see if they're upset. If they're angry about something, don't take long. You look at the person's face and you figure out they're angry. You know, you can see you see their face. You know where they're at. See, in prayer, we need to find out where God's at. God knows where we're at. Believe me, He knows. <laughs> He knows every bill you can't pay. He knows every sickness and disease the enemy's trying to put up on you or has put up on you. He knows all things. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. But we're not. We know parts of the mind of God. That's what prophecy is. We know a part of the mind of God. We get a part of it, but we don't know. In true corporate prayer, we're seeking to know where he's at. Amen. See, last week I preached upon the obstruction has to be moved. But you know what? This morning I found myself praying, God, I pray I'm not the obstruction. Father, I pray I'm not the obstruction that has to be moved. See, I prayed all week. I, I, you know, I encourage y'all to keep that before God. Keep pounding. Keep pounding. Keep pounding. That's a, see, corporate prayer don't end when we stop the day. Corporate prayer, we take that thing we were focused on as a corporate body, and we, we, we keep praying that. We keep praying that. Don't mean you're praying out loud. Don't mean you pray in tongues the whole day. It means right there in that frontal cortex, you've got that thing kind of up before God. Right. It's just right there. It's that thought that keeps going up before God. You know, when you got time, you pray it out loud. Yeah, you pray it with your mouth. But it's just out there. You keep it before God. That's for prayer. But because I was praying corporately, God began to deal with me and say, you know what? Sometimes people are the obstruction. Not necessarily your physical being, but your attitude. The attitude of our heart can be an obstruction. Mm -hmm. mm, help us, Lord. Can I say something, church? This, I know, this isn't our first moment. Yeah. We've been through hard times before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen the church full, and I've seen it near the end. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the abundance. I've seen where we had money that was not money to burn necessarily, but we had more than enough. Remember that? We used to have, I mean, easily, I could buy anybody in any time. If I didn't get a nickel out of the offering, I knew we could give a thousand dollars because we had money in excess. We could put it back. I remember one time we just had a speaker phone with five thousand dollars in it. 
We didn't have to worry about bringing somebody in. By the way, both Tim or Woods is coming 17th and 18th. He'll be here Saturday night, Sunday morning here at Piedmont uh, that Sunday night, you know, with Apostle Charles. So we're imagine about that. But we didn't have to, you know, if God said bring somebody, we didn't have to be concerned about whether or not people were going to love them enough to give an offering. An offering was already there. Amen. 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 I think it spoils some people because a lot of times we bring people in, some people give nothing. You are cheating yourself. Cheating yourself. Amen. So we've come to this place now where we've been up, we've been down. So I begin to look back. I said, okay, God, last time we was full, what was going on? Huh? What, what, what did we go on? Every church goes through pruning. Now don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I don't care how big you are, you're going to go through the time when you go to decline a little bit. Because that's called pruning. That's just the seasons of the Lord. Nobody grows forever. Amen. You do come to a place of pruning. Then when you come out of that pruning, you'll grow more. But we got a hard walk. And what happened? And the Lord said, You stop praying. The Lord said, You got a lot of people. You got to feel good about yourself. And you stopped praying like that. That was long. You stopped. Let me tell you something. When, we, when it starts filling up again, that's when we really got to pray more. Right? Now, the enemy attacks this house because just like you've heard the prophetic words over this house, guess who else heard them? The enemy hurt. But the obstruction we have to remove is not just him, it's within us sometimes. But if we humble ourselves, we take care of a lot of that in, in the very beginning stage. And I think all of us should pray, Lord, don't let me be the obstruction. And if what I'm doing is obstructing, I want that removed from me. And in corporate prayer, it's so much easier to get it removed than when we're just praying individually. It really is. When we lay that thing up and say, God, if there if I'm doing something that hinders, if I'm doing something that obstructs, God, I want you to drive a stake through it. I want you to put your finger on it. I want you to burn it out of me, Father. I want you to be an all-consuming fire on me. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. And I want to be something that helps lift every time we come together. I want to be Amen. the person that's lifting us higher and not the person dragging us down. Amen. 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 My people will humble themselves and pray and see my face. Boy, this, this don't sound like and turn from their wicked way. way. Amen. Now he started that off by saying, my people. Yeah. He's not talking about the left and Israel, right. anybody else. He ain't talking about the Muslims. He's talking about his people. Right. And he said his people have some wicked ways. Mm, help us, Lord. When we come to a place where we don't even like each other in church anymore, that is wicked. That is wicked. When you've got something in your heart against a brother or sister that affects your worship to him, you need to hit that prayer closet. You need to hit it hard. You need to stay there until you settle that and got it out of your heart. Because Amen. that is a weed that will grow up into a root of bitterness. Help us, Lord. And you need to repent. It's a wicked way. Forgive us, Lord. Everybody say it's a wicked way. It's wicked. When we just flat out read the commandments of God and disobey them, that's a wicked way. Everybody say that's a wicked way. That's a wicked way. You know, the kingdom of God is suffering because people just will not do what God said to do. That's a wicked way. Right? When we have this unforgiveness and we begin to work against each other, when we're not on the same page, when the Bible says when there's self-seeking and envy, there is ever evil work. Self-seeking is, i got to have it my way. I want church and I want God and I want God to move. I just want it to be my way. Help us, Lord. That's self-seeking. I want pastor to preach, but I want him to preach messages I want to hear. That's self-seeking. I want the worship team to be awesome and great. I just want them to sing the song I want to hear. That's self-seeking. Amen. Oh, when somebody so gets well. blessed in church and it makes us angry. What? Yeah, that happens. 
Why did they get blessed and I didn't get blessed? Man, I'm holy. I pray. I, I'm the one that shows up and does everything at church. And God, you bless them. They don't do nothing. Help it's us all, Lord. Envy. It's called envy. It says every, every evil work follows that. When you open yourself up to that self-seeking, that envy, it says the enemy can get into your life, into your home, into your church, and do every evil thing. He has access. Everybody said that's an obstruction. That's an obstruction. So we have to make sure we're not self-seeking. That what we're seeking is his self. Him. You know? Yeah, we, let me tell you something. When we come together and, and he is honored, you're going to be taken care of. You are going to be taken care of. Thank you, Lord. Love and joy will flood the house. You will be ministered to because what? You put, he is the priority, all of us. Everything comes from that. And then it comes down and this church is taken care of. When it talked about the church, the early church came together and they prayed together, guess what? They loved each other too. It said they were, there was such power, such love among them that the people were even afraid to join them. Because God's presence was so strong. So they, they put their prayers up to him and his blessings came down on them and they were one. And that's what we want, right? And turn from their wicked ways, then something's going to happen. Then I will heal from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to prayer in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now this building has been anointed and set aside for God, but as a people, you have been anointed and set aside for God. Amen. It don't matter if, if, there, if we were not in this building, if we were down at the rec center, guess what? If we came together, we would be the anointed church of Jesus Christ. And God said, I have chosen to hear you. I have chosen to hear from wherever you are now. See, back then it had to be that temple, it had to be the temple. But now it's wherever you are, you and I are at as the church. God said, I will turn my ear to hear. I will turn my eye to see. Amen. When we pray. Isn't that awesome? Amen. That's awesome. Amen. Herod's violence to the church. Go with me to Acts chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 1. I want to get rid of a charismatic sacred cow this morning. You've been taught that if you serve God, if God's in it, everything's going to be smooth, everything's going to be wonderful, no bad things ever going to come into your life, everything's just going to be roses all the days of your life. That's not true. This early church was full of power. They were full of the unction. They were full of the anointed of God. They had all 12 of the original apostles among them. They had it going on. They had miracles. They had healings. They had people being added to the church daily. Those that were being saved. Everybody say, that's what was happening. That's what was happening. Amen. That's good stuff. But sometimes, no matter how, who you are, the devil gets a little bit. Amen. It don't, it don't mean that you've done something wrong because the devil hits you sometimes. Sometimes he hits you because of what you do in your life. And you need to know that. Everybody say, I need to know that. Sometimes you're doing everything right. You're serving God. You're doing it all right. You're tithing. You're giving all things. You're praying. You're, you're ministering to the sick. You're out there winning the lost. You're doing every single thing you're supposed to do. Living your heart with your whole heart unto God. And something comes into your life and attacks you. You say, why did this come from? What did I do? You did what was right. And the devil attacked you. And he got a lick in. He gets his licks in. It's not a fight unless he gets his licks in. Everybody say, he'll get a lick every now. Oh, you say, oh, I didn't hear all of you. I didn't hear all of you. Every one of you in this room this morning, he's got his licks in. Come on. He's got his licks in. But that ain't, let me tell you something. That's just when the fight begins. That ain't the end of the fight just because he got a lick in. That means he just got out there, and that is not his strong suit, church. 
The devil don't want to be out there obvious and on front street doing his business. He likes to do it behind the scenes, hidden. That's how he likes to work. But when a church is so powerful and moving, it forces his hand, and he has to come at you head on. And that is always losing ground for that brother. So if the devil's hit you and he's got his licks in and all you were doing was right and serving God, then guess what? Let the fight begin. Because you're going to win. You're going to win. If you'll fight, you're going to win. Thank you, Lord. Thank Amen. You, Lord. And that's why a church has to fight. Praise the Lord. Because pray one to another, you get healed. See, as we're praying for the corporate church, who are you praying for when you pray for the corporate church? You're praying for you. Do you understand that? When you're praying for this church to grow, and this church to do its thing in the community, what it's supposed to do, what it's created to do, what it's destined to do, what it's prophesied it will do. It's so you you receive all of the blessings. Amen. The devil gets a lick in every now and then. Let's read it. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John. You know what they were called by Jesus? The sons of thunder, or Jesus. The sons of thunder. James and John. Jesus had a click. Anybody know Jesus had a click out of those 12 apostles? Who did you see when Jesus went to some, some place in Portland? He went on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who went with him? John. Somebody named him. Peter, James, and John. Peter, this James, and his brother John. Who was it that came to Jesus? Who shall be greatest in the kingdom of God? It was this James and John. How many know this James had a great destiny? How many know this James was a son of thunder? When he spoke, he brought hell itself. This was a powerful, anointed, I walked with Jesus. Jesus' hands were on him. Jesus called, blood bought, apostle of the early church. This was him. Everybody said, I think he was probably doing right. I think he was probably doing right. Then he killed James. The brother of John. He was sold. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intended to bring him before the people after Passover. Now, I just want us to put ourselves in that spot for a minute. Now, a lot of y'all think Apostle Charles is just uh, some supernatural being that's not clothed in flesh. Because Brother Charles is a great man. All you got to do, I, 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 if, you, if you want to spend a day and just hang around somebody and feel like you've been washed and cleansed and feel better than you've ever felt in your life, just go hang out with him a day. He don't like to preach to you. Just hang around. He's a good man. One of the best I've ever met. Powerful. I mean, if I need to hear from God, I'm going to go call, call Brother Charles. Seriously. But let me tell you something. Brother Charles needs the church to pray for him. Because why? Because he's a target. We're wondering. You know, we need, man, we see a lot of great men of God fall away. Let me say something. Johnny Book was a great man of God. He got taken out way too early. There's been other men and women of God we're seeing fallen in church. Can I tell you, we have a responsibility to pray for those men and those women. We have a responsibility to pray one for another. Amen. That's right. If you don't like me, pray for me. Pray I'll preach better. I want you to. I would appreciate it. If you don't like the worship team, the way they sing, pray for them. What? Right? If you don't like the elders, pray for them. If you don't like somebody in church, pray for them. I guarantee you can't pray for somebody and hate them all. That's right. I'm not about not, not praying and asking God to change them. That's or right. Them. I'm not about praying for them. See, you might start out praying wrong, but you pray long enough to pray right, and all the once you'll notice something happens inside of you. That's right. That's right. Something happens inside of you, and you'll never see that person the same again. Amen? Absolutely. So James has been killed. 
Think of your favorite minister right now, how shocked you would be if you found out our government had went out and murdered that guy. Just murdered him. That's what Herod did. He murdered James. This wasn't no justified killing here. He flat out murdered him and he was going to murder Peter. And he locked Peter down pretty tight. I mean, this is a say of sayings here. This is segregation of segregation here. He's in the innermost, innermost, innermost of the prison and sleeping between two guards. This looks like a hopeless situation, church. How would you like to know that, let's just say a uh, prophet over here got locked up. You know, we'll, we'll say we've got a wicked regime in there, which I don't think we do right now, thank God. But let's just say we've got a wicked regime up there, and all of them once they decide they're going to start locking him in a guard. And, and we find out, man, they just seized him, went into his home, they seized him at night, they arrested him, and we find out he's in the, 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 that prison out there in Colorado that nobody's ever escaped from, and that he's in the innermost of the innermost of the innermost of that prison. And ain't nobody get to him. And the government's done, done got this thing. They done rig it. How I many you know some things can be rigged? They rigged it. They're going to execute him in the next day. They're going to execute him tomorrow. How I many you know that's pretty hopeless? Yeah. Isn't that a hopeless situation? Yeah. Sounds like it. But listen, but I'm going to tell you something. The church has got a weapon. Hallelujah. The church has got a weapon. Praise the Lord. Lord. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constantly. Constant, insistent, consistent, persistent prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was asleep. Did y'all get that? He was asleep. He's fixing to be executed in the morning. But Peter was asleep. Let me tell you something. There is a place in Jesus where it don't matter what the devil's doing. The Bible says he gives his beloved sweet sleep. Hallelujah. Praise yeah. the Lord. He gives his beloved sweet sleep. He's right there. All that's hanging over his head. You know what? I, I believe Peter might have had this kind of attitude. Well, God, if you deliver me, that's going to be awesome. And if you don't, I'll see you in the morning. You can't lose, church. You can't lose. <laughs> Peter knew he couldn't lose. If God wants me out of here and delivers me, then praise God, well and good. But if you don't, I'll see you in the morning. You can't lose. But the church is praying. Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord. I want to remind you, there are angels of the Lord in this room. Glory to God. I am still praying. Thank you, Jesus. I'm ready to sing. Oh, yeah. I want to sing. I, I used to not be like that, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of at the point now. I said, God, I want to see them. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be overly terrified when I see one. And I want to be able to cooperate when I do see them. I want to know what they're there for and how to cooperate with them. But I've been praying, God, I don't mind. God will see. It. You have not because you asked not. So I didn't ask. Them. Amen? Amen? They're here, though. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by. Now, I wonder why that angel of the Lord, how did that angel of the Lord get there? Because I believe the church was praying. Stood by. And a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Glory to God. He didn't have a key. Everybody say he didn't need it. I don't care how impossible it looks, God's got something more powerful than anything they've got. They can lock you up, lock you down, do everything they want to do, but at the end of the day, God's going to need a key. Thank you, God. The doctor can sign your death warrant and say, You're done, you ain't going to live past the end. But God's got the key. Amen. God's still got the key. Yes. Arise quickly, his chains fell off his hand, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. Other words, we ain't no hurry here. Take time to get dressed appropriately. Mm -hmm. 
God, let me tell you something. God is in the midst of everything. God's got time for you to be appropriate. God's got time for you to take care of whatever needs to be done. God ain't never hurried or rushed. He can handle business. Amen. Gird himself and tie on his sandals, and so he did. He said to him, Put on your garment and follow him. <coughs> so he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the, by, by the angel who was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. You see, Satan's had a gate that's been shut against us, but it's about to open of its own accord. Because God's got some people with some keys. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you were beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw them, they were astonished. So let me say this. Sometimes you're praying, and, 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 and it's powerful and it's mighty, but it don't mean you've got really great faith. They don't look like they really, really, really had great faith because they were shocked that God answered the prayer. Can I tell you, I had been shocked sometimes. I had been praying, and God moved so quick, and I'm just mighty. You really did that. Yep. You really did that. Obviously, I wasn't, it wasn't my great faith that moved the situation. But somehow in the midst of praying, enough faith, because it only takes a grain of a mustard seed, right. enough faith got in there to move the mountain. And there was enough people praying that somebody got hold of that grain, and next thing you know, Peter's there, and everybody's kind of shocked. But it worked. <laughs> but it worked. Everybody say, but it worked. And they opened the door and saw him, and they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James. Now this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. If you study this out, not the James that was killed by the sword, who became the leader of the church, of the church at that time, the Jewish church, and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Now I want you to know something. God delivered people. I'm going to tell you something. He's got something for your enemies, too, if they persist. If your enemies persist long enough, and the enemy is the devil, by the way. And unfortunately, anybody that wants to align with him too long is going to get, get, get some trouble. And as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when... Herod had searched for him and not found him. He examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, to ask for peace, because their company, country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an orientation to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of God, and not of a man. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. If you look that up, that's a historical account, by the way. That's not just in the Bible, which is all we need, is just in the Bible. That's his historical account. He was given a speech and he dropped down and literally, it literally, worms were eating him. And he took about two or three days to consume, to die, but he was in absolute, total agony. Now, he could have repented. 
and that probably wouldn't have happened. But he didn't repent. Matter of fact, he got, he got used pretty much like God, did he? But he made a mistake. He touched the apple of God's eye. Not just James. He touched his church. Church, I want you to know something. You are the bride of Christ. You are his body on this earth. And he loves you dearly. And when the enemy attacks you, he don't like it. But he has set up the way his kingdom works. And he don't move until we pray. He has decided that's the way it's going to be. Now, but when we pray, he goes to work. We talked about yesterday how when Daniel prayed, it took 21 days for that answer to get there. The, prayer, the answer was sent the first day he prayed. Let me guess something. Last week we prayed together. We didn't pray long. We prayed strong. And the answer was sent. Now, I don't know if, you know, if it's a construction or whatever is still, still there. I just know this. Until it's full, we're going to keep praying. Then when it's full, we're going to pray that it gets full. We're not going to stop praying anymore. We're not going to make that mistake again. Everybody said we learn from our mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. We learn that. Now, we're going to pray this morning about that obstruction. And as we're praying corporately, you go in the secret chamber of your heart and say, God, am I doing something that's obstructed? Because God always starts with his people. Humbling themselves. Right? And humbling myself means that I have to remind myself I might be the obstruction. I might be that which hinders. Right? Because the enemy uses people too. He can get in there. He can cause you to be a hidden plant in the church doing his bidding. And guess what? You don't know it. That's why we have to pray. Because I believe if we pray corporately a few minutes, wherever how long we pray, I believe God's going to put his finger on some things in our life. And guess what? When we repent, and we say, I'm not going to do that again. And we don't do that again. It's over with. It's forgotten. It's in the book. And that part of the obstruction is removed. I want to tell you about one other thing before we go into prayer. There was a time Israel was attacked. Hezekiah was king. And the, uh, I think it was the Assyrian king came up. He, he just told, uh, you know, uh, Hezekiah, said, you don't have a chance. We got you out number 20 to 1, whatever it was. And he says, every other person that's ever stood against us has fallen. And you're going to be just like them. Send a, send a note, send a letter by the courier. Hezekiah went into the temple of God and he spread that letter out. And he said, God, what he's saying is true. They've got us outnumbered. We're cut off. It don't look like we can win. But God, they don't have you. <laughs> Everybody say, they don't have God. They don't have God. We do. We do. We do. He said, God, they haven't taken into consideration you. And Lord, it's true. Every other king that stood before him is fallen. But we have the great king. And then he said, God, they're laughing at you. Can I tell you something, church? The devil's been kind of laughing at us. Said, oh, you moved, you did this, you did that, you thought this was going to happen, you thought that was going to happen, but I have shut you down, and he's laughing. But if you keep reading that story about Hezekiah, the Holy Spirit began to speak, and the Holy Spirit said, the virgin daughter of Israel laughs at you. Hallelujah. Now, the virgin daughter of Israel represent the church. Amen. Said, we're laughing at you, because we know at the end of the day, Who's going to have the last word? Glory to God. Y'all know the story of what happened. 180,000 men went to sleep one night and did not see the sun the next because God sent one angel. Everybody say one. One. One, one angel. One angel. And he slew 180,000 men in a night. Now, a guy named Jason used to be here. Jason's kind of different. God uses kind of different folks. He sat out and figured out, tried to figure out how quick that angel had to be killing somebody to kill 180,000 men in one night. And let me tell you something. You have to, you have to average two or three a second. I forget what it was. He told me. I was amazed. I never thought of it like that. But that one angel went through that camp like a buzz saw. They got up the next day. He got 180,000 troops. They said the king went home. Everybody say the king went home. The king went home. The church is victorious. 
And guess what? God ain't through with the king yet. That king that went home and said when he got back home, he got assassinated. And he was no more. Why? Because he dared to touch you, church. Amen. Because he dared to church, touch Israel. He dared to touch him. Now the enemy's been sitting up there in heaven. He's been laughing at us. But you know what? What did the y'all ever watch the movie Torah, Torah, Torah? <laughs> you remember when that Japanese general said, We have a waking or sleeping giant? The devil has a waking or sleeping giant. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to pray. We all we do is pray. You don't know what prayer is, but that's all you think prayer is. Now, prayer is the main force, the main blow. To God. It is the thing that defeats him every single time. So we're going to pray and we're going to focus on.